We now want to look at the key topic in the whole of F9. What I mean by that is we want to look at investment appraisal. Remember what we talked about before. One of the fundamental issues in financial management is should we or should we not invest in a capital asset? As such, the key issues were return, are we going to make something out of the deal, and risk. What we're looking at here is a form of decision making. Nothing more, nothing less. And you may have learned from your previous studies that decision making requires us to use relevant costs. Don't worry if you can't remember that. We will talk about relevant costs later. You see, when we look at investment appraisal, you could argue it is the single most important investment made by the organisation. The reasons for that are these. If we're looking for the reasons for importance, The first issue is this. Investments can be very sizable. Very sizable in absolute terms, but very importantly, sizable in relation to the business. Size matters. As such, we have to assess whether or not the investment is worthwhile. Secondly, they are long term. We make the investment today, but the benefits or otherwise of the investment will impact on the business for many years into the future. Thirdly, if we were to be cynical about this, we spend the money today. The outflow is now. That means that the outflow is known with some degree of certainty. But when do we get the inflows? Well, we get the inflows into the future. It is terribly easy to spend money. The difficult thing is to make sure that the money spent today will generate benefits into the future. I suppose we could wrap all of these up. If we were looking if we were looking at investment appraisal, we could say it is necessarily a strategic decision. It will impact on the corporate strategy of the business, where the business will be in three, five or ten years time. If we make the right decision, fine, that will help the organisation. If we make the wrong decision, it may harm or even destroy the organisation. So, when we look at investment appraisal, because of its very importance, as we've highlighted here, instead of just looking at one measure, we're normally looking at a range of measures to understand the impact on the organisation. So if we move on and consider those measures, well, in simple terms, we have basic measures, relatively simple measures, and we also have measures relating to what is described as discounted cash flow. Now, your examiner is very clever here. Of course, the discounted cash flow bits are likely to be the bigger mark earners. But you cannot ignore the basic areas. The examiner has a track history of examining these basic methodologies, something like every other exam. Therefore, you have to pick up marks for payback. You have to pick up marks for R-O-C-E, or what may be described as A-R-R. -R. They may only be three, four, five marks, but these are must-have marks simply because the majority of students will get them. So, we've got our basics, fine. When we look at discounted cash flow, there are two measures. One is the net present value measure. 
And what we will find is that the NPV measure will arise again and again when we look at the more sophisticated errors, when we start adding in the fun bits. In addition, we have something called the IRR, internal rate of return. Now, we look at internal rate of return, yes, in investment appraisal. But the key use of internal rate of return is later on. In fact, this is the interesting thing about the DCF that we're looking at here, the discounted cash flow. Yes, it is important from an investment appraisal perspective. But it's also important throughout the whole syllabus. Remember we talked about the cost of finance in the business, what we describe as the cost of capital? Well, DCF is important there. Remember we talked about valuation of a business. Again, it is important there. A couple of other areas that we could discuss here, not measures as such, but still very important. We have to understand how annuities work. Not a difficult issue. And we also have to understand what a perpetuity is and how that works. Okay. So, when we're looking at the sort of things that we have to focus on here, we have four basic measures. Now, with those basic measures, what I intend to do here is to use the same question to try and understand what is going on. So if we look at this example here, we have an investment. We have an initial outflow today, £100,000. Now, if we're looking at time, we are standing at year zero. Or to be more exact, we're standing at the end of year zero. Year zero has just been. Tomorrow is the first day of year one. And something that we must get used to with regard to cash flows, most of the time, we identify the cash flows either with the end of year zero, or the end of year one, or the end of year two. Then we have cash inflows. 50 year one, 40 year two, 30 year three, 25 year four, and 20 year five. These are the inflows generated from the investment. Later, we have to make a distinction between cash flow and profit. Not a problem, we'll find that very easy. And finally, if you buy an asset, maybe at the end of its life it is worth something. It has a residual value. We have that there. In year five, we assume that we sell the asset on the last day of the last year, and bosh, we get some money back. Ah, at the bottom we're told that the cost of capital is 10%. If you wish, this is the rate of interest or rate of return. We have to talk about that a lot. But at the moment, we don't need it. So, with that in mind, let's go straight on and consider the first technique. The first technique we're looking at is something called payback. And I can't stop myself. I feel I have to describe precisely what it means. You see, when we look at payback, we're looking at the length of time it takes for cash inflow from trading to, well, I can't say it any other way, to pay back the initial investment. Well, no problem with that. But what I want to highlight to you is this. We end up with this. We end up with the length of time. The answer is going to be in years and part years. Well, okay. If that's the case, what we could do is we could use the example here to understand what's going on. If that's the case, let's just go away and maybe see how we could lay this one out. You see, we know that the initial investment was 100. Oops, 
everything in thousands. That being the case, we also know the inflows. The inflows per annum in years one, two, three, and four. Notice I'm not bothering with year five because I think I will easily have paid back by year four, maybe earlier. That's very important, and we'll come back and talk about that in a moment. Now, if we look at our period cash flows, what we see is we had 50 year one, 40 year two, 30 year three, and 25 year four. But to understand when we paid back, what we really want to do is we want to look at the cumulative cash flows. We want to sum the cash flows year on year on year. So, in simple terms, by the end of year one, our cumulative cash inflow is 50,000. By the end of year two, 50 plus 40, 90. By the end of year three, 90 plus 30. Wow. By the end of year three, or sorry, somewhere during year three, we have paid back. So if we were looking at answering this question, we could say something like this. Payback equals two full years plus, well, how much did we need to pay back in the third year? Well, the amount we needed to pay back was the difference between the amount we had already paid back and the initial investment. So the amount we needed to pay back was 10,000. And how much in total was paid back in that third year? Well, the total paid back in the third year was 30,000. So what we could say, our assumption being that the cash inflow is a constant rate during the year, is payback is two and one third, or if you wish, 2.3 years. Now, my question to you is, is that good or is that bad? We have an answer. Is it good or bad? Well, who thinks good? Who thinks bad? Well, I'm going to upset you both. You cannot say whether it is good or bad unless you are given a target payback period. To give you an idea, Many years ago when I had a proper job, the company I worked for generally looked at payback over a three-year period, at least for manufactured uh, goods. If, however, we were doing infrastructure, we may look at a longer payback period. For example, if anyone builds a bridge or a tunnel, the payback on something like that could be many tens of years. But from your perspective in the exam, you say nothing about whether it's good or bad unless you are given a target in the question. Sometimes you are, sometimes you are not. Well, okay, I think we can all do what we've just done here. It is possible that you'll be required to do this sort of calculation. Can I tell you that your examiner often makes it easier? And remember, if you've got an easy trick, you really must use it. For example, what happens if we have this sort of situation? What happens if we have equal cash inflows? Something that we will talk about later as an annuity. If I told you that the investment was 60,000 and the cash inflow per annum was 25,000. Do we have to go through the rigmarole of what we did before? Well, the answer is no. You see, to get the payback period in this case, all we have to do is this. All we have to do is take the investment and 
divide through by the cash inflow per annum. It really is that simple. In this example, what, 60 over 25? Yes, we get 2.4 years. Saves a little bit of time, doesn't it? Now you have to remember these little tricks. There is no point trudging through a question bit by bit by bit by bit if there is a quicker way of you doing it. If nothing else, it gives you an advantage against those people who are in the exam hall on your left and on your right. So, we've looked at payback. We've got this figure. Oh, what can we say? Is that good or bad? Well, yes, you know now. It is only good or bad in relation to a target. That's all you can say. So if the target is given, make a comment. If it's not, don't say a word. My question to you now is this. What does this show us? We have a payback period of 2.4 years. Well, let's go back to the first question. Maybe it's easier to see in that question. We have a payback period in the first question of 2.3 years. Does it give us a measure of return? What do you think? Well, the answer is no, it can't do. Because when we look at payback, it only looks at the cash flows up to the point of payback. It ignores cash flows in the following years. For example, here, we paid back after 2.3 years, but you and I know that there are cash inflows for a further two and a bit years. So, there is no measure of return. Right. If there is no measure of return, what does payback show us? Well, there are two things that we could talk about here. The first thing it shows us is the cash flow. If we are tight for cash, we want our cash back sooner rather than later. On the simple basis that if we get it back, we can maybe reinvest it elsewhere. But that's not the important one. The key feature is this. I think we know intuitively that a shorter payback period is better than a longer payback period. Why? Why intuitively, deep down, is that an obvious answer? Well, what I'm trying to get at is this. We're standing today at year zero now. But when we look at an investment, we are looking way into the future. And the one thing we know about the future is that it is uncertain. Therefore, we know what we're going to do tomorrow, next week and next month. But do we know what we're doing in one, two, three, four, five years? Well, the further we move away from today, the less certain things become. So you could argue this, if you have a short payback period, you're certain, or at least relatively certain, of achieving payback. The longer the payback period runs, the less certain you become. When we look at payback, it is a simple measure of risk. So let's just briefly look at some advantages and disadvantages. The first advantage, it's simple. I hope it is. I think we're all happy with that. The second one, it is a measure of risk. That's the big one. The third one, it gives us an understanding of the cash position, which of course may be important. And the fourth one, well, we'll discuss this in a moment. It uses cash flows. We'll come back and discuss that and compare it and contrast to something else later on. Disadvantages? Well, it doesn't consider the time value of money. You may, not, you may or may not know what that means at the moment. Don't worry about it. We will spend a lot of time discussing it. 
The critical disadvantage is that there is no measure of return. Because we only consider cash flows up to the point of payback, we cannot get a measure, measure of return. Now, that's very important. You see, that means that we cannot use payback on its own. We can only use payback in addition to other questions. In addition to other measures of return that we will look at. Well, okay, let's look at an exam standard question from the past. This question comes from quite some while ago. And as such, when we look at the requirements, we have to reflect that maybe some of the requirements are less likely to arise. But my view is when you look at paper F9 or any of these papers, you have to get into exam standard questions early. Because you have to understand the standard at which the examiner will pitch the exam. If you're looking at any exam question, where do you start? Well, most definitely. I would say to you, you must start with the requirement. In fact, in your exam, you have some reading time. In your reading time, I advise that the only thing you look at is the requirement. The requirement for each question in turn. So if we look at part A, Assuming that the bid is accepted by Bexel, calculate the payback period. Yes, we know how to do that for the investment. And it gives you some information about land and buildings if they're immediately sold and sales figures remain static. Note the mark allocation. Very small indeed. This is not the main part of the question. Of course, we want to do well on it, but this is not the make or break. Let's just look at the other parts of the question before we do part A. If we look at part B, Chromex has also appraised the investment in Bexel by calculating the present value of the company's future expected cash flows. Well, remember we talked about discounted cash flow? That's what it's all about, and we'll talk about that later. Reading on. What additional information to that required in A would have been necessary? Now, we can't answer this question just yet. But I'm guessing, I'm hoping that after you've looked at your in, uh, further investment appraisal, you will find it incredibly easy to pick up five marks here. All we need is to come up with a list of five different other things that we have to consider. And you could argue that when we look at net present value, the list of things that we look at in there directly relates to this answer. A lovely question. Now, before we leave this, let's just note the rest of the paper here. You see, what we've got there are eight marks relating to investment appraisal. But then we've got another 12 marks to do with something completely different. What's part C all about? Explain how and why the UK government might seek to intervene in the takeover bid for Bexel. Well, this is interesting. It specifically relates to the UK government, and that shows the age of this particular question. What we're looking at here is a little bit of economic environment, which most definitely comes into your exam. I would be very surprised if it was so UK-specific now. In recent years, the ACCA has more and more focused on the international nature of its product. And as such, we would be very unlikely to get such a UK-centric question in the exam. We will briefly look at it in a moment. Finally, part D. Suggest four ratios which Chromex might usefully compute in order to compare the financial performance of Bexel with that of companies in the same manufacturing sector. 
Oh, OK, shouldn't be too difficult. Four ratios. You should include in your answer a justification of your choice of ratios. Briefly explain why it is important to base a comparison on companies in the same sector. Well, OK. What I want to pick up on is this. We're not talking about ratios here, but I think it's a very useful thing to pick up on before we go any further. And that is, whenever I look at an exam question, I always try and do the same thing. If we just go away from here for a moment. You see, whenever I look at an exam question, what I want to do is to understand the context of the question. What does the examiner want me to do? And as such, what I want to do here is to break up the question and consider three separate aspects. Firstly, what am I being instructed to do? What are the instructions? Secondly, what is the subject? What am I going to talk about? Very importantly, if I know the subject, I can then use that subject as the header for the answer that I'm looking at. And if we're looking at any question, are we looking to come up with a perfect answer? Well, my answer is no way. A perfect answer is simply incidental to scoring marks. The whole point of doing the exam is to pick up marks. As such, what I try and do is to break up the mark allocation, to understand where those marks come from. So, instruction, subject, mark allocation. Now, if we go back to the question we were just looking at, what are the instructions? Well, they're slightly odd instructions here, but I think we can cope with them. If you look at part D, couldn't you say that suggest is one instruction? I think in this case it means state or something like that. Yes? Tell me four ratios. Given that you've said those four ratios, what do you have to do with them? Well, I think you have to justify them. Are there any other instructions in this question? Well, yes, we also have to explain. So in that context, couldn't we say here, and of course you'd never write this out in the exam, we have to suggest, justify, and explain. So what's the subject matter? Well, if we go back, if we're looking at the subject matter for the first two, I believe that both we suggest and justify the four ratios that we're going to use. Therefore, we're going to talk here of the four ratios. Notice we have to do two things. If we're going to get the marks, we don't just state them, but we have to say why we have picked those. And it shouldn't be too difficult, I hope. When we explain, what are we explaining? Well, let's go back. We're explaining why, I think, we want a same sector comparison. Now, I don't think that this is a difficult answer. We want to pick a company in the same industry sector because we want to compare like with like is the basic answer. So that's the subject, same sector comparison. Now, what about the mark allocation? Well, I don't know where the marks come from. All I know from the question is this, that I've got six marks to play with. But I think we can come up with an educated guess. And remember, our educated guess is not necessarily exact. But if we have a mark allocation in our heads, 
we can then work towards the mark allocation. Now, looking here, we've got four ratios. I'm reckoning we have a minimum of four marks. What do you think? For each ratio, do we get half a mark for the suggestion and half a mark for the justification? It's possible, isn't it? And that means that we would have two marks over here. Now, I'm hoping that what I'm telling you here is quite obvious. But what I am concerned about is this. I know from students of my own who do these sorts of questions, it is terribly easy to maybe answer that bit, but completely ignore the other part. And if you answer just about the four ratios, you know that the maximum marks you will get are four. And that's no good. What I've done, I hope, is I've managed to illustrate to you how effectively I've got, what, four one-mark answers to make, each ratio in turn, and a two-mark answer. And that should make our answering that much easier. A very simple idea. If you practice this again and again, it will become second nature. It is very important for a paper such as F9. But of course, we can see the benefit of something like this in any paper that we do. I am a great believer that we leave nothing to chance. By having a routine where we look at the same things again and again, the instruction, the subject, and the mark allocation, we can ensure that we pick up the marks in the exam. Very briefly, let's look back at part C. Now, I don't really care that much about part C because I don't think that this question will come up again. But, what is the most important word in part C? Which is the word that helps us more than anything else? Have a read. Think about it. Don't let me tell you. You decide. Well, I don't think you're going to get the answer, so I might as well tell you. The important word is and. Now, how can that be so important? Well, the simple deal is this. Whenever you see and in the question, you can break the question down into two sub-questions. So we have a mark allocation of six. But because in this question we're asked to explain how and why, presumably we've got three marks to discuss how and three marks to discuss why. A further way of breaking the question up and making the question easier to answer. Right, enough of that. Those are just a few observations in passing. Let's go back and look at the case in hand. We were talking about payback. And with that, what I want to do is to understand the sort of information that the examiner has given us.